Hey, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, first lecture on a series of popular scientific lectures planned in NSES to celebrate the 75 years of India's independence, which is popularly termed as Ajadika Amrut Mahoschav. Uh, we are very glad that uh, we are starting our uh, celebrations in a way from today. So I am extremely delighted to introduce the speaker of today's lecture, Professor Michel Danino, who is going to talk about an extinct river that was and is at the very heart of Indian cultural traditions. This is a topic in which we should all be deeply interested because it not only has implications for archaeological sciences, but also is important for geological and hydrological studies that attempt to understand evolution and demise of river systems. Our speaker, though born in France, has spent most of his adult life in India, studying and researching Indian prehistory, history, and culture. Uh, he has contributed significantly to the historical research. Some of his famous books are The Lost River on the Trail of the Saraswati, Indian Culture and India's Future, and Sri Aurobindo and India's Rebirth. His books are extremely well researched and highly inspiring. Professor Danino has lectured and taught at several educational institutions. Since 2011, he has been teaching courses on Indian civilization and knowledge systems at uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Gandhinagar, where he is currently a visiting professor. He has been assisting the Archaeological Sciences Center in IIT Gandhinagar for some time now. So it is coming up very nicely, as I understand. He is also a convener of a CBSC committee for the course called Knowledge Traditions and Practices of India and a member of several government and scholarly bodies. In 2017, the government of India awarded him with the prestigious Padma Shri for his work on education and culture. Auna, I now invite Professor Michel Danino to deliver his talk on the Saraswati River's decline in the Holocene. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Michel Danino. Michel, over to you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Jyoti, for this uh, very kind invitation and introduction. It's a great pleasure to give this talk at the National Center for Earth Sciences Studies in Trivandrum. And um, perhaps one day I'll, I'll be visiting your institute more physically. But uh, for today, it's a great pleasure to speak on this, um, as you said, this extinct river system, which played a, a large role uh, in, in the history and culture, I should say the proto-history and culture of Indian civilization. Uh, in fact, uh, we should, I will not spend much time on the whole literary background. I will still nevertheless show one or two points, but we should remember that the, the Sarasvati is the very first river in India to be turned into a goddess long, long before Ganga, for example, because her past goes all the way to the Rig Veda, where Ganga doesn't play any, any major role at all. It's just mentioned once. So this uh, Sarasvati has a great cultural importance right from the beginning. And yet, yet uh, curiously, strangely, this river disappears. So um, I will show you a few slides and, and uh, give some very brief background on I'm sorry, I'll just go to the beginning on this river system so that we all understand what exactly is at stake. Um, first of all, a bit of geography for those who may not be familiar, and uh, this is to uh, localize the entire problem. Uh, it is a textual problem, it is a cultural problem, it is a, a hydrological, geological problem, and it has many more aspects. So to keep things simple, uh, for reasons which I will very briefly mention, this river system has been identified 
with that of the Gagar Hakra. Hakra is a name that um, is uh, flu uh, that is current in Pakistan, in this Cholistan region of Pakistan, on the west part of this map. Uh, so within the Indian Haryana, Punjab, Rajasthan, it is known as the Gaga River. And uh, I'll explain why this is identified with the ancient Sarasvati in a minute. But you can see here that uh, even this simple map, simplified, and I will show you more complex maps as we proceed, shows that we are in the interfluve between Yamuna and Satlej. And we, we are therefore in a fairly flat zone where a lot of seasonal rivers still flow occasionally and sometimes powerfully when you are lucky to have powerful monsoons and that this Gaga River has a number of tributaries. So one has a name, Sarsuti, which has been there for centuries at least and possibly much more. And there are important tributaries like the Markanda, which I will speak about a little bit towards the end, and more uh, rivers, most of which are fairly inactive, uh, but occasionally revived during strong monsoons. And it's not difficult to see that the connection between the Satlej, for example, and this Gaga system is, is a matter of just a few kilometers. Uh, the, the, the prison gap is just a matter of a few kilometers. And the, the Satlej, for example, uh, has a sharp bend here at Rupar, which is an important uh, site of the Harappan civilization. Uh, but uh, the one hypothesis which has been voiced right from the 19th century is that it was actually part of it was branching into the system uh, uh, in earlier times. And this is the same for the Yamuna, where uh, it, it's only a few kilometers uh, separating the present Yamuna bed from the Gaga system. Uh, there are other river systems here, the Chotang uh, and uh, the, the uh, Patyaliwala, uh, we're connecting uh, Patyala and, and the Gaga. So it's, um, we can already see that there's a certain complexity but we are going to increase that complexity as we proceed. Now, the identif the, the um, shall I say, the record of the name Sarsuti, it goes back quite a few centuries, as I said, and it was noted in one of the very first precise maps of India, and I'm only showing you a, a small area of it, uh, which is by James Rennell, sometimes called the father of Indian geography. Uh, you know, these designations of a father are, are always a bit arbitrary. But anyway, uh, he was the first surveyor general of, of Bengal because um, Brit Brit Britain only had Bengal under its control at the time. And here you see that this is the Delhi region. Uh, this is the Sirhind region, which is the foothills of the Shivaliks. And you see here, so some of the of the cities you can recognize, like Hisar, like uh, Rotak, and so on. And you can see here that there is a Saraswati River shown as a tributary coming back, flowing down from the Shivaliks, and shown as a tributary of the Gagar River. So the spellings, of course, are archaic, but uh, the, the fact is therefore not new. And uh, I emphasize this because, you know, the Indian press, whenever it speaks of the Sarasvati, whenever there's some new finding or some new claim or some new theory, always sticks the word mythical right next to Sarasvati. So it's a mythical river. And this is something I have never understood because, of course, there is some mythology attached to the river in the Indian text, but this is always the case in Indian text. Uh, there's a lot of mythology attached to the Himalayas, for example. Nobody speaks of the mythical Himalayas, right? So uh, this is an arbitrary designation. And and uh, the this uh, word Sansuti is noted very early on and repeated um, in, in map after map, especially after this uh, French geographer, very eminent and uh, very uh, noted in his time, Louis Vivien de Saint-Martin, uh, associated, I will cut a long story short, associated several findings, those maps from Renel and others, 
topographic surveys by the British in the early 19th century, which uh, documenting this broad, broad, broad bed crossing what is today Haryana, Punjab, Rajasthan, uh, because the British were looking for a possible path for an army to invade Sindh directly. Punjab was, you know, still held by Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And therefore, if they wanted to invade and conquer Sindh, they had to find a, a, an alternative route. Eventually, uh, uh, the, the uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh's empire fell apart and the British conquered it and then moved into Sindh from there. But this path was, was documented and a lot of freshwater wells in particular along this dry bed uh, were recorded, including also the presence of all kinds of shells and mounds of ruins and local legends that associated the 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 um, uh, the entire desolation of this landscape, uh, which was an extremely arid and sometimes desert landscape, uh, to the desiccation of that river system. So all this was recorded, and then finally the the well-known Nadistuti Sukta, the hymn in praise of the rivers in the 10th mandala of the Rig Veda that recorded precisely the Sarasvati as being located between Yamuna and Sutlej. It goes something like, and please excuse my, my bad pronunciation, but it is Gange, Yamune, Sarasvati, Shutudri, which is the Sutlej, and so on. And this hymn moves all the way from Ganga, and it's the only significant time when Ganga is mentioned, to Indus, Sindhu, and even beyond the, the Afghan tributaries of the Indus. So it was a very um, precise bit of data, and it's very rare in, in the Rig Veda that you get such precise data, which situated without any ambiguity the Sarasvati between Yamuna and Satlej. And then by the early 19th century, this bed of the Ghagar, very broad in, in some locations, was uh, located in the same region. So uh, Vivian de Saint Martin put two plus two, and this, uh, you know, decided that this Gaga system was a relic of the Vedic Sarasvati, and this was adopted immediately by all Indologists, geographers, uh, the Sanskritists, uh, explorers like Alexander Cunningham here, uh, the founder of the Archaeological Survey of India and uh, who, as you can see, uh, also situates the, the Sarasvati and the Ghagar in the same region. So there's no difficulty, and this will build a broad consensus, which will shortly include archaeologists. I will show you why. So Oldham's paper, um, papers rather of the late 19th century are well known. And you can see here also all Sarasvati bed. And you can, you can see uh, this uh, Ghagar Hakra, uh, which he, this paleo bed, hence the dotted lines, which he traces all the way down to the run of Kutch. And this run of Kutch is of some importance, and uh, some of us are trying to uh, to generate more studies on, on it. In fact, I have the privilege of being associated with Professor Jyoti Ranjan Roy and several colleagues from IIT Gandhinagar in one such study currently going on on this Kadir island here with the famous Harappan site of Dholavira is located. And, and there are many complex issues connected to the run of Kutch, which I will not go into today. So, so uh, you can see that Oldham associates the Ghagar with the tradition of, of carrying the name of Saraswati. So that name is still known amongst the people. So there's a consensus. And what is even more striking is that the Indian literature records the disappearance of the river. So there is, uh, the, the, the river gets lost, and it's not only lost in the tradition, the local tradition, but also in the literature. By the time Mahabharata is written, which is much, much later than the Rig Veda, Rig Veda does not record any discontinuity in the river. On the contrary, it says Giribhya a Samudrat, from the mountain to the sea. So for Mahabharata, there is no question of discontinuity. But in the Brahmanas and later Mahabharata and other pieces of literature, 
This point, Vinashana, Vinashana, you understand in any Indian language, it means loss, it means ruin. And, the, and sometimes it is also called Adarshana, where the river becomes invisible. I'll not go into further details, but that point is recorded. And it even becomes a very sacred pilgrimage site from where people, perhaps the even first Tirtha Yatra of Indian tradition, from which people will go upstream from Vinashana all the way to the Shivaliks, all the way to the sources of the Saraswati. So therefore, the, the, the retreat of this river is well recorded in the literature. And, and um, finally, what is still missing is the input from archaeology. So we had topographic studies, textual studies, and now we have archaeology coming in and then Later on, we are going to have satellite studies, geological and hydrological studies. So uh, Marco Rechstein is the great uh, explorer and archaeologist who mandated by Archaeological Survey of India in 1940-41, explored the regions of uh, what is today uh, Rajasthan, northern Rajasthan, and eastern Pakistan. And he identified for the first time sites of Harappan culture in this region. Now, I must remind you that Harappan civilization is also known as Indus civilization. It was initially known as Indus Valley civilization because the first sites were discovered in the Indus Valley, like Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa, of course. Today, the, the word valley is dropped by archaeologists. They just say Indus or Harappan civilization because we know by now and Orenstein was the first to pioneer those studies, that this civilization extends well beyond Indus Valley. Well, it extends into Gujarat, it extends into Haryana, even Western Uttar Pradesh, even Northern Maharashtra, and all the way to the border between Pakistan and Iran. So it's a very vast civilization. I'll show you a map in a, in a couple of minutes. And Orenstein was the first, and his paper, his report was a survey of ancient sites along the lost Sarasvati River, because he was also a Sanskritist, and he had studied all the Indian texts, and he was quite convinced that this Gaga River was the relic of the lost Sarasvati, and that's what he writes in his paper. So for the first time, we have these uh, Harappan sites, and they are going especially after independence. So we are celebrating 75th anniversary. Uh, but a few years after independence, uh, Indian archaeologists led by um, Amal Ghosh were uh, beginning to explore more sites because um, Orenstein mostly worked in this region. He, may, he did explore this a little bit also, but he was in a hurry to move into Bahawalpur state, as it was called in those days. Today, it's called the Cholistan Desert. And this is where he identified Harappan sites. Uh, this was done, you know, through certain artifacts like Indus seals, the famous Indus or Harappan seals, uh, typical copper bronze objects or pottery items of Harappan designation, classical Harappan uh, de description, as they had been identified already in Mojodaro, Harappan, and other sites of the Indus Valley. So, uh, Kali Magan is a famous site here. We will visit it briefly later. I want to point out. Uh, Birana and uh, Banawali here, Rakigari is, has been much spoken of in recent times. It's a very, very large site, um, a little explored, unfortunately, because most of its mounds are under modern villages. So this is, this is uh, uh, an important um, uh, map showing you the density of Harappan sites. In fact, it's much greater than this. But there is also a break, and I will draw your attention to this break here during the Matthew Harappan period. This Matthew Harappan period extends from 2600 BC to 1900 BC, 700 years of urban phase, urban development of the Indus or Harappan civilization uh, during which the cities thrive. Uh, before that, there is an early Harappan phase where villages grow into towns and the networks expand, the technologies develop, and there is a gradual move towards urbanism, which technically begins in 2600 BC. So 
this is the background of archaeology briefly, but archaeology, as you will see, also record. So this is another map showing you now this entire civilization. The, we were focused on this area in the earlier map with this break, which I pointed you to. You have the dates here in the caption. And um, and you have, of course, Mohanjo-daro in Sindh, Harappa, in Punjab, but also a lot of important settlements in in Gujarat, uh, like Dholavira, which I mentioned earlier, on this Khadir island of the run of Kutch, Lothal, uh, south of uh, Ahmedabad, and a lot of sites correlated with uh, the Harappan civilization, but only partly they are known as Sorat Harappan sites. Uh, those in red are, are pure, if I may say so, uh, classical Harappan sites. So it's a very extensive civilization, but then archaeology is going to give us certain messages, um, very important ones, which now our duty is to try to correlate with recent geological findings. So remember, one first such message is that there is a break in, in, uh, in the string of sites, which did not exist in the early Harappan phase, and um, the Pakistani archaeologist Rafik Mughal, Rafik Mughal was the first to point out, because he explored this whole region in the 1970s, he was the first to point out that this shows that the river has already weakened and is no longer able to push its waters during the Matthew Harappan phase uh, into Cholistan, which might have been fed instead by an arm of the Satlaj. You see the Satlaj here. So this is what archaeology on its own comes up with. There's a second message of archaeology. And here you can see the early Harappan phase, 3000 BC or so, and you can see the continuity of sites, which, as I pointed out, is broken in the mature phase. But there's something dramatic happening in the late Harappan phase, where now there is complete desertion of the central basin of the Sarasvati River, or Gagar, if you prefer. All these Matthew Harappan sites, which you see in the central map, are gone. They do not sustain a late Harappan phase. These uh, sites will be found in the bottom map, all, you know, much, much closer to the Shivalik Hills, because here there are still seasonal streams, or maybe a few partly perennial streams, but not able to push their waters um, further downstream anymore. So this is one important message, and this happens by roughly 1900 BC, of course, plus or minus a century, because this would not have happened overnight. Uh, uh, although there have been geologists, um, you know, like, for example, uh, the late uh, Professor Valia, assuming that some tectonic event might have suddenly uplifted this whole region and driven some of the waters of the system uh, into Satlej and Yamuna. So there are many you know, competing hypotheses in, in, in play, and I will come back to this at the end of my uh, talk. So this is another map by Josen and Clift. I'll return to the paper of uh, uh, um, uh, 2012, which was much spoken of, where here, here you have the early and mature phases combined. So there's no break, as I pointed out, uh, in the uh, system, but here suddenly in the late Harappan phase, there is a complete break. And uh, these two sites are actually a mistake. They do not exist as late Harappan. So, um, and then another map, which I may show you from my colleague, Professor uh, Prabhakar here at IT Gandhinagar. Uh, this is again the late Harappan phase, so post 1900 BC. And you can see here complete abandonment, as I show, showed you uh, earlier, complete abandonment of the central um, basin of the Sarasvati. So the natural hypothesis here by archaeologists is that by post-1900 BC, the system has collapsed. And it, it is sustained only through uh, petty streams, or maybe not so petty always. In fact, even today, the Gaga can be a very impressive stream. And time permitting, I'll show you at the end a short video of, of just one or two minutes, uh, but I don't want to interrupt my size now, where I'll show you a very impressive gaga in the monsoon of August 2019. 
just just two years ago. And, uh, and you will see how uh, uh, impressive that river can still be during the monsoon. But of course, uh, uh, beyond the monsoon, it is purely seasonal and its river, its waters will not flow beyond this region approximately, right? So now we have another discipline coming in and I'll be very brief uh, on, on it. It is basically satellite studies. This is the famous Yashpal paper of 1980, the very first trying to combine uh, satellite imagery with you know, some basic topographic knowledge from the ground and identifying a lot of paleo beds, which you can see here, uh, connecting possibly according to them, the Yamuna system in ancient times with uh, the Gaga system and similarly from Ropa, from uh, connecting this athlete with the Gaga. So the problem with the, and this is going to expand the, lots of studies with by ISRO, and uh, this is a major ISRO or ISRO study showing that these, uh, uh, these beds are actually complex. There are many paleo beds, and it's not as if the river had a single, you know, bed at all times before it dried up. No. You, you know very well, in fact, uh, most of you better than I do, that this uh, plane is extremely flat. The Indo-Gangetic plains are very flat. There are hardly a few meters here and there uh, to, to delineate the various uh, beds. And therefore, the, the, the Indus itself is very well known uh, as having shifted considerably in the course of its history. Uh, so this, these are uh, some of the paleo beds identified by ISRO for the various courses of the Sarasvati uh, before it, it eventually dried up. And you can see here that some of them join uh, the, uh, the, the run of Kutch, uh, where the old maps also showed, but some even are proposed to join the, the, the run of Kutch uh, even more to the east. So anyhow, there's a complexity here, and uh, I will simply show the more recent studies, this is my Hindi and others, 2016, where uh, they, they used much more complex uh, digital enhancement methods to bring to light more paleo beds out of the uh, satellite imagery data. And, uh, and you can see here how they have uh, you, some of these paleo beds come out much more clearly. Uh, so summing up their findings, this is one critical area where in Rajasthan, we find Kalibangan here, and we have Patiala. I was telling you about the Patiawali uh, season uh, stream. And, and here, the, the identified major paleo beds are very clear, uh, even one of them connecting all the way to Rakigari. So it is clear that um, uh, some of the uh, major cities were right on or close to these paleo beds which does not exclude other settlements beyond the, the, those major beds. I'll come back to this issue later. And they also did some sediment studies, and you can see the area where they focused in particular. Uh, this is the, the main uh, Gagar Paleo bed, you might say, one of the three channels which they identified. And then they uh, published their little logs, and I will not go into full discussion. I just want you to, to spend half a minute watching this picture because I find it beautiful and actually telling us, in summary, the whole complexity of the issue. Because if you, whether you take little logs, you see here, this is the Paleo Channel where, they, where I showed you on the previous map, and this is just outside. And you can see that even within the Paleo Channel, you have very different histories. There's, of course, a certain commonality, but you have, for example, those gray fluvial sands. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to those sands which have been identified with contributions from the upper, higher Himalayas. And strangely, some of them are suddenly very close to the surface, while generally speaking, they are below layers of silt, clay, uh, sandy, uh, sandy silt, and so on and so forth. So you can see that this, uh, uh, just a few hundred of meters apart, you, you might get a very different history. And therefore, it's a cautionary message 
that uh, just having a few sediment cores and getting a few you know stratigraphies and dates uh, that's not enough to tell us the entire story of the system in fact when other researchers uh, orango and petri put together again all the paleo channels from all the uh, basic satellite imagery studies and you can see the, the, the mehidi here the original yash pal study and several others this is the kind of map you get which tells us almost that if you cross from Yamuna to Sutlej, almost every point of the map is a Paleo channel. I exaggerate a bit, of course, it's not quite so, but there are dozens and probably even many more than what you see on this map. And therefore, it's an extremely complex history, which uh, will take, uh, perhaps will never be fully, fully known, but uh, clearly, uh, especially when you keep in mind that these channels have been shifting, uh, we, we, we have a very interesting uh, but very complex study area. And this is what they brought out in their study, that um, uh, all these factors join to create an extremely complex picture in which water availability and location is dependent upon a multiplicity of factors and difficult to predict in the long term. So that's a second cautionary message. Uh, another type of uh, study came from uh, Saini, Tandon, and then uh, Rajiv Sinha will join. And these are basically uh, uh, not only sediment studies, with dated through OSL in particular. And, and you see that some very channels have fairly recent dates. I, I request you to keep this in mind. But there will also be resistivity studies, which uh, this will be mostly pioneered her uh, and uh, others and uh, this is purely you know measuring the resistivity of the uh, sub uh, layers and trying to make out the uh, the water bearing layers and the position their depth and so on and here you can see that again there are gray fluvial sands layers which are associated with the high himalayan contributions and they still bear large amount of waters uh, uh, which are at a depth of varying between some 150 meters as you can see here um, uh, all the way to uh, just a few tens of meters uh, where uh, at some locations so uh, this is a, a very nice map showing you the course of the Gaga all the way to Kalibangan in, in uh, Rajasthan Banawali is here and there are other sites. So this is a confirmation that these paleo channels identified by satellite imagery are very real and they did exist and some of the water is still captured underground. The difficulty is, is the dating and the, the establishment of a proper stat stratigraphy and, and the whole history of it, which can be done only through repeated uh, sedimentology studies and uh, OSL uh, TL, but also more complex isotope uh, dating. And uh, our host uh, today, Professor Jyoti Ranjan Roy, has been uh, one of the contributors to, to these isotope studies. So this is a summary, in fact, of one of the transects studied by uh, 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 Dr. Sinha and, and his PhD student Imran Khan in those days, uh, 2019. And it's a major paper. And you can see that uh, uh, we are at a depth varying from about 10 or 15 meters all the way to 110 meters. And, and uh, these uh, saturate, water saturated um, layers of sand are still holding huge quantities of fresh water. Now, one huge debate, and I will try to sum it up because uh, we could spend a lot of time on, on each individual study, uh, is, is whether when this river was flowing, it was perennial or not, whether it was mighty or not, because this word mighty has been associated uh, since uh, the days of the Sanskritists when they found uh, descriptions in, in the ancient text. For example, Rig Veda speaking of Maho Arna Sarasvati, Sarasvati of the mighty waters, of the great waters. So how mighty was it and when did it flow? So all these questions um, have had different voices, different answers, 
for example, Jawson and Cliff's paper of 2012, spoke of um, glacial fed rivers only uh, in uh, about 12 to 14,000 BC, uh, at least 14,000 years ago. And uh, during the Holocene, uh, for them, the, it was only monsoon fed. There were only, but of course, the monsoon was more powerful uh, in the early Holocene. This is well known. And uh, this would have been sufficient to explain that the, the, the whole region was full of water reserves. But according to them, during the time of the Harappan civilization, the mature phase, it was only monsoonal rivers that were activating this river and in an increasingly seasonal way. So this was one uh, voice, and which has been repeated a lot in, in uh, 2012, and which basically gave us a pessimistic view of the river system during the Harappan times, the mature Harappan times, as becoming just seasonal. Uh, this was repeated by uh, Rajiv Sinha Ajit Singh in their uh, 2019 paper, where there was a large river system, or everybody agrees upon this once upon a time, with major contributions from the Sutlej, from the Yamuna, uh, therefore, you know, higher Himalayan contributions. And that is what leaves us with all, all these layers of uh, gray micaceous uh, sand in particular. Uh, but this was only uh, before 12,000 years ago, according to their study. And uh, another a study of the same time, 2019, also concluded, and this was Aditi Dave and Ashok Singhvi, among others, concluded that all major rivers of Himalayan origin ceased to flow through this region before the Holocene, and certainly well before the Harappan culture. So now this raises very important questions, which uh, where we, we have to try to come to uh, join archaeology and geology. So before I try to do this, uh, and this is the uh, Ajit Singh and Rajiv Sinha paper of, of uh, 2019, uh, which I've just quoted, before we do this, I want to show a few other, uh, and remember the Saini paper, which was giving us more, much more recent days. Now these much more recent days have also come back in a paper by uh, Anirban Chatterjee and uh, Jyotiranjan Rai, uh, which was uh, published in uh, 2019, uh, but based on the field work of Anirban Chatterjee two years earlier, which I will also refer to. So in this paper, uh, they of course agreed that there was a mighty perennial uh, river once upon a time, but then they proposed dates of 9 to 4.5 kilo annum uh, so uh, thousands of years ago, uh, during which the river was perennial and was receiving sediments from the higher and the lesser Himalayas. So there is a kind of a, a break, as you can see, and this latter phase, according to them, was attributed to the reactivation of the river by distributaries of the satellites. This is an extremely important point because otherwise we might be tempted to imagine that, you know, when the satellite deserts the uh, Gaga system, it happens once and for all. But there is evidence of reactivation. And in fact, even in historical times, even in the medieval period, there is a, uh, an Islamic text uh, uh, which gives us evidence that the uh, satellite system and the Gaga system are still connected. So occasional reactivation, because the region is so flat, due either to tectonic changes or due to changes in the history of, of you know, sediment deposition, leading to various uh, phases of aggradation, erosion, and so on, uh, you know, what geologists broadly describe as reworking of, of, of the sediments, all this is possible. And therefore, it might also account for some of the complexity that we see through the satellite imagery. So the re this revived perennial condition of the Gagar, which can be correlated with the Saraswati, likely facilitated the development of the early Harappan settlements along its banks. Why early Harappan? Because this phase ceases about 
2500 BC, 4.5 kilo annums. And that is when we have the mature development phase. So, so this is a, a very important find. And as I said, it was based on the field work of uh, Anirban Chatterjee two years earlier, where you see that he also collected sediments, but not just sediments, also shells, uh, which are trapped in those sediments, which are very convenient for uh, uh, radiocarbon dating, for example. And you can see also the lithographs pointing to this gray micaceous uh, sand at various depths and not always the same depth, depending on where, uh, where you, you drill. Uh, this is uh, one image which I borrowed from his thesis, where you, you can see the presence of these gray micaceous sands, sometimes even very close to the surface. So um, uh, this is the, 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 his conclusion, even before the, the joint paper with Jyotiran Janroy was published, that some dates were quite recent, surprisingly recent, uh, uh, even uh, 3,400 BC in, in some locations. The colony of Anubgar is in Rajasthan, close to the uh, Indo-Pakistan border, uh, where a colony of freshwater uh, bivalve shells was encountered embedded in situ within this gray micaceous, micaceous gray sand layer, which I remind you is a higher Himalayan signature, and that is giving dates of about 4000 BC. So therefore, it is not as if the mighty perennial river, uh, which everybody agrees upon, pre-Holocene river, disappears once and for all. There are reactivations, and probably from the from the Sutledge end. But I'm going to show you some more evidence, very recent. Uh, this is a paper piloted again by Ajit Singh, but by this time he was a postdoctoral fellow with us at IIT Gandhinagar, and uh, he did field work in the Markanda Valley. The Markanda, if you remember my initial map, is one major tributary of the Gaga system. And uh, he found, and you can see the dates in, in his abstract here, uh, various terraces pointing to uh, various dates, of course, bracket, different brackets of dates, but some of them uh, being, again, quite recent and uh, showing uh, some evidence of paleo floods uh, paleo flood deposits, whether these were regular events, isolated events, would require further study to be told in, in detail. But uh, the conclusion was that the Marconda River peak discharge was several orders of magnitude higher than the late uh, Holocene. So I'm sorry, during the late Holocene than the modern day peak discharge. So therefore, even this river was much more important, much more significant. Uh, in, in, in this period, and its contribution to the Gaga system uh, was more significant than we might otherwise assume, judging it from its present condition. So uh, you can see that um, every new, and this is a map uh, by Ajit Singh, uh, which uh, sh uh, points to larger flooding of the foothill rivers that sustain flows in the downstream reaches of the Gaga Hakra Paleo Channel during the late Harappan civilization. This uh, black rectangle here points to the area of study, which is the, the Markanda Valley in the Shivalik uh, uh, Hills. Uh, and you can see the Markanda here flowing into the Ghagar. So uh, every new study, in a way, answers certain questions, but also provokes new questions, which is probably as it should be. However, there is also an important message from archaeology which uh, lends more weight to the recent studies by uh, uh, Anirban Chatterjee, Jyotiran Janroy, and Ajit Singh and others uh, here for the Markanda, which is that these cities of Kalibangam, of Banawali, of Birana, in the central um, uh, basin of the Sarasvati, which were deserted when the Sarasvati broke up finally around 1900 BC. Uh, these cities are bit right on the edge of those rivers, of, of the Gaga River, Gaga bed. One or another channel of the Gaga bed. So this is Kalibangan. This is uh, Banawali, 200 meters uh, where the fortifications have been located. 
from the edge of, you can see, dry bed of the Saraswati. This is an archaeological survey of, of India uh, ground map. And here you have Bihrana again on the dry bed of the Saraswati. So the question is, if as some of the early studies uh, by Joson or more recently by Dave and Singhvi, uh, if uh, the river was completely gone, completely seasonal, by uh, the mature Harappan phase, uh, how would the Harappans have built those cities right on the edge of virtually dried or just seasonal rivers? It wouldn't make sense because these rivers are extremely important communication channels for the Harappan trade. And we see a lot of evidence of this trade in these settlements. There are workshops producing all kinds of Harappan artifacts and crafts, and, uh, and therefore, there is a, they are part of the Harappan uh, internal as well as external trade network, which requires uh, river communication. You cannot transport raw materials and finished goods just through bullock carts. It would not be a viable proposition. So therefore, my conclusion, and, and this is also an interesting map by uh, Dr. Prabhaka with inputs from Dr. Bisht, which shows uh, because there is a recent theory that if there was no river, maybe all these Harappan sites were located on various kinds of channels. Yes, some of them were, but we see also that many were located right on these paleo channels. And this is further evidence that these paleo channels were flowing. Otherwise, why should you take the trouble of locating those uh, settlements there? So my possible scenario is that yes, we all accept that there was a mega river, a mighty river, um, with uh, contributions from the settlers of the Yamuna. And this was broadly pre-Holocene, but we should not exclude occasional reactivations uh, in the mid-Holocene uh, with contributions through the settlers, certainly, of Hima, higher Himalayan um, uh, sources, glacial sources. And even during the early and probably mature Harappan phase, there must have been a perennial rain-fed river. Just because a river is monsoon-fed doesn't mean that it has to be seasonal. It all depends on the size of the catchment area. It depends on how uh, forested the Shivalik hills would have been, because forested land can retain, uh, of course, much more water beyond the monsoon time. And it would depend also on the utilization of, of water and uh, how the Harappans were managing the environment. So these are all factors adding to the complexity. And uh, therefore, the archaeological evidence is that in the mature Harappan phase, even as aridity increases and the, the, the climate is known now to have been growing more and more arid during the, the mature Harappan phase, uh, the Gagar or Saraswati was still flowing down all the way to Anubga. This is what the settlement pattern tells us. And it could have received still occasional contributions from the Miyamuna, possibly from, uh, sorry, from the settlers, more likely, but possibly from the Yamuna too, through intermittent reactivations of paleo channels. So, however, this seems to end by 1900 BC when the Gaga becomes a seasonal foothill river, and perhaps due to some tectonic event, and, and also due to uh, 200 years of drought, which are now well documented. This is known as the uh, 4.2 kilo year event. And um, Yama Dixit and a, a number of other paleoclimatologists have well documented this event. So this is, uh, as briefly as I could, <clears throat> the story of the uh, uh, Saraswati River, but I would like to take one minute to show you if, uh, if I can, if this video is visible, and somebody will have to tell me, is my video visible here? Can somebody let me know whether... Could you, can you see the video? Uh, yeah, it was very small video. Yes, 
Okay. I could see. Her, yeah. Okay. I don't know whether the sound will probably not be audible, but this is the Jaya River. This is the Jaya River in 2019. So I will I will stop this video. I will also show you the Markanda in in the same 2019. So I assume that my this video is so you can see that this Gaga River, which is called sometimes a petty stream, a puny river, is not a petty stream at all. When of course uh, the monsoon is generous. So uh, this is the Markanda, a much smaller stream than the Gaga, also also not so so petty at all when there is good monsoon. So this is today. And you know, four thousand years ago, uh, the the what the, the catchment area would have been even much more. Keep in mind that there are lots of dams on these rivers today, as many of which have been built from the medieval time, from the medieval time. And uh, and I will stop sharing my screen now. So keep in mind that. Today, many of these waters, much of this water is diverted to irrigation. These dams did not exist in Harappan times. So all the water captured in the catchment area was flowing uh, completely in, in the riverbeds. So it, uh, it, it, uh, it is difficult to recreate today the condition of the Gagar in Harappan times, but we should not uh, assume uh, that the, the uh, desertion of the satellites, perhaps uh, 10,000 or 8,000 BC was a final event. Uh, I think we can take it for granted that uh, the, the contributions continued for some time. And even after they ceased around 4,000 BC, perhaps, or 3,000 BC, uh, even then the Gagar could have continued as a substantial river based on the, the uh, lower Himalayan or Shivalik, rather, contributions. So with this, I will end. And uh, if there are questions from the audience, I'll be very glad to try to answer them. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Uh, it was uh, wonderful. And uh, some new things also I learned. Uh, 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 and I hope uh, people would have uh, understood the basic problem behind uh, why we are looking for a river that doesn't exist <laughs> so there are a couple of questions here right now i see so maybe i'll start with that then uh, uh, if i even i have some questions we'll see how it goes uh, so first thing is uh, so one scientist from nss is asking uh, that what is the link between if i understand what he's asking between far desert and saraswati uh, so probably he thinks uh, all sand in Thar could be from Saraswati and all that. Or there is river beneath it, there is saying. So maybe you can shed some light on it, please. So um, the major paleo beds of the Ghagar Akra River actually skirt the Thar Desert. Uh, they, they are within the Thar Desert because even if you like the Cholistan Desert beyond is an extension of the Thar Desert. Geologically speaking, it is. Um, but uh, most of the sands that you see on the surface of the Tar Desert are, are of more recent origins, as far as I know. Um, the, the, uh, these are mostly aeolian uh, contributions, which uh, you know, were deposited after the, the, the vegetation disappeared tens of thousands of years. Uh, the, the connection between the Sarasati and the Tar Desert would be real if, and some geologists uh, like um, uh, Amal uh, Kar, for example, uh, if Amal Dar, I'm sorry, if uh, the, the Gaga system was once upon a time connected with the Luni River, then we may assume that the Sarasati at some point flowed through the central Tar Desert 
and uh, whether it it was the, the Luni is actually a paleo bed of the Sarasvati is is one theory. Most geologists today do not consider that that this is the case. Most uh, of the literature which I have seen uh, assumes that the Luni always flowed independently, and the Luni, as you know, flows on the northern side of the Aravalli. It is also flowing through partly through the Tar Desert, but uh, it it flows on the southern part of the Thar Desert, whereas the Sarasvati is on the northern end. So, so the, the connection is, uh, is, is not uh, that the Sarasvati system created the, the, you know, the sands in the Thar Desert, if that is the question. This is an independent uh, geological phenomenon. Okay, thank you. And uh, Anirban is asking, uh, uh, can you please shed some light on the delta of the river Saraswati? And then his second question is, how long Saraswati was flowing independently to the Ran? So these are two big questions, of course. And that uh, that lower end of the Saraswati, Gagar Hakra, if you prefer, is actually less explored. As I said, we have currently, uh, uh, with the, Professor Jyoti Ranjan Roy here, uh, uh, Professor Vikram Jain of Earth Sciences, IIT Ghandinagar, and several more of us, we have a project uh, trying to throw some light on the um, the estuary of the Sarasvati through a study of the of the Kadir Island in the Run of Kutch. And um, uh, this, there is a delta, yes, certainly, which would have been shared at some point with the Indus, because the Indus delta also is very complex. And some branches of, of it are fairly recent, you know, after the Alabond uh, event, uh, this huge earthquake in Sindh in uh, 1819, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which uh, suddenly raised a huge dam known as the Alabond. Uh, the, some courses, lower courses of the Indus were also diverted and, and found new courses, uh, which were perhaps ancient courses used by the Sarasvati. So uh, the, the exact uh, delta of the Sarasvati is complex. I showed you two maps uh, which showed, uh, even the Oldham map shows the Sarasvati ending uh, on the western side of the run of Kutch. Uh, but there are other maps showing the Sarasvati, like the Isro map showing a paleo bed towards the eastern side of the run of Kutch. So this seems to have been a delta. But uh, unless we have very precise sedimentological studies of all the branches of this delta, it will be difficult to propose a precise history. And um, we're hoping that the current project will give us at least one answer, which is that was in Harappan times, because it is uh, strongly suspected, and we almost have firm evidence now, that the, the, the run was a navigable area, that the water level was higher in Harappan times, uh, even in historical times, this is well known. During the time of Alexander the Great, there is textual evidence that the run uh, was navigable, though treacherous. So the question was, were these waters from the sea, and was therefore the, the, the run an arm of the sea, or were these waters coming down from either the Indus or Sarasvati or both? So these are major questions which uh, we hope some of the current projects will throw light on. In fact, there are several projects currently located on the run, and uh, we may have to wait a little bit. OK. I, uh, yes. I can see a question from Dr. Suresh Babu in, in the chat box. Can I? Uh, yeah, please it? take it. Yeah. So he asks, uh, the activation of channel with surface water at different times has been discussed. The paleo channels must be allowing preferential pathway for groundwater, whether any work has been done in this aspect, whether sutlage water is still flowing underneath. So as far as underground reserves uh, are, are understood, the best studies, as I pointed out, the best studies we have at present, as far as I know, are the resistivity studies, which show uh, that uh, not only there are huge reservoirs in these, uh, especially these uh, sand layers, um, sand water-bearing sand layers, 
there are huge reservoirs, but what I did not, and, and your question is very good, what I did not point out is that there is evidence of a slow movement of this water. And if I remember those papers, it's I, I, I am very tentatively quoting, I'm not sure this is correct, but it's like a few meters uh, per year or something of the sort. So the water table is not immobile. There is a, There is still some motion because there is still infiltration upstream which is pushing the whole uh, aqua i mean the whole water layer uh, through the sand uh, bearing layer so um uh, this is known but otherwise to speak of such water flowing underneath would be probably a different phenomenon if i'm uh, uh, catching your thought correctly and i don't think there is such, any such evidence uh, I think that the, the contributions of the satellites have left those uh, paleo reserves, if you wish, behind. But uh, to speak of an underground river flowing at present, I think is not uh, something that geologists are considering. Uh, isotopic source estimation, yes, Dr. Suresh Babu. And if you see the, the, all the papers which I have mentioned, and there are many more which I didn't have time to, to list, uh, most of these researchers have done isotopic dating of, of the, the sediment cores which they extracted, uh, sometimes also adding some data from OSLTL. So this is how we have these, these relative chronologies. Uh, yes, and, and uh, Dr. Ajit Singh is giving you uh, some reference here, and there are several more. So uh, do we have more questions from other? Yes, yes. Uh... I have from the YouTube, I have a couple of questions. Uh, Please. Uh, yeah, there is a one uh, Uttara Nath is asking, is there any probable contribution of unsustainable use of water resources along with geological and geomorphological factors in disappearance of Saraswati? So, so I if know. I understand the question right, would mean could the Saraswati have disappeared partly through overexploitation? Yes, yes, I, I guess. I do not see how that would be possible because in let's say to simplify 2000 BC, 4000 years ago, uh, Harappans were only exploiting, uh, you know, runoff water possibly diverting some of the uh, Ghagar or Sarasvati river into side channels. That's very possible. And therefore, it has been assumed that they might have been conducting some irrigation through, uh, through the Ghagar water. But there is no evidence, for example, of any substantial canal. There are no such things as Harappan built canals, uh, which initially some of the archaeologists were, were conjecturing. That no evidence has come to light, but they might have been using, you know, what, what is called in India as nanlas, uh, channels, natural channels, to divert some of the river water into for, for agriculture. But this would be a limited use at the end of the day. And um, the cities, of course, the Harappan cities were also drawing, uh, mostly through wells or through reservoirs, ponds, as you might say, seasonally filled ponds. Uh, all these systems existed and have been documented. But you know, the Harappan population was low compared to today's population. Altogether, the entire civilization would have had only a few million inhabitants, just a few. So um, I don't see how this could lead to over-exploitation. Uh, in those days, certainly not. Today we might, of course, because you know, today sometimes, uh, sometimes we um, envisage unsustainable uh, schemes, for example, uh, Chandigarh has a, has a lake which is filled by uh, water pumped uh, from the Gaga system through through huge uh, through through bore wells and and it's it's uh, I forget the number I have it somewhere but it's millions of cubic meters a year so that is not sustainable because this is actually drawing from the underground reserves uh, which many of us have argued should not be today tapped unless there's a vital necessity to do so. Uh, one last question. Uh, Anirvan is asking whether, uh, what's your view on the uh, glacial connection, independent glacial connection for Saraswati? Yes, so so Anirvan, I will not go too deep into this question, but uh, I may recall that 
the, again, there are several schools of thought. For example, uh, VMK Puri and other Indian geologists uh, in some older papers uh, were actually uh, assuming that uh, Yamuna was flowing into the Gagar system in the Markanda Valley, which uh, Dr. Ajit Singh has explored, uh, even, even during Harappan times. So the Yamuna uh, through the Bata Valley was connected directly to, to the Markanda, which is indeed a very broad valley, and then was feeding the Gagar or Sarasvati system, uh, even, even during uh, as recently as the Harappan civilization. Uh, and um, uh, the late uh, uh, Professor Valia was also inclined to, to share a similar uh, hypothesis and uh, was also connecting the Yamuna in recent times with the Gaga system. More recent study is, is throwing a lot of doubt on this hypothesis. And um, the, the recent study of the Markanda Valley by Dr. Ajit Singh and, and others actually seems to contradict it. So therefore, if there were uh, contributions from connections with glacial sources, as you asked, they would not be through the Markanda. They would be through the reactivation uh, of, of the sutledge, possibly that remains to be established, though uh, Yamuna, uh, occasional reactivations of their contributions to the Gagar system. It would not be directly uh, through the Gagar itself or you know, some of its tributaries. So this is as, as far as I can make out from all the studies taken together. Okay, uh, Michelle, I think uh, we'll stop here, all question and answer. So I once again, thank you very much for such an informative talk. And uh, from, from NCS family, as well as on my, from my own behalf, I thank you very much for uh, enlightening us about this uh, uh, research problem. And uh, we hope to host you sometime physically uh, in future and uh, listen to you about some other aspects maybe. So thank you very much and thank you everybody for your active participation. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti, and, and thanks everyone. Thank you. So we stop here.